Yeah, let me do. Let me just repeat the disclaimer. The information provided in this presentation is intended for general information purposes only and should not be considered as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. As a naturopathic doctor, I am sharing insights and suggestions based on my expertise in natural health and wellness. However, it's important to consult with a medical doctor before making any significant changes to your health regimen, especially if you have underlying medical conditions, you are taking medications or have specific health concerns. And we said the topic today is nourishing your way to health, nourishing your way to health, unlocking the power of proper nutrition. And there are two things I, I want to have you to consider. The first thing is to get uh, paper and writing instruments. Uh, the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. So please, please take note. The second thing, the second thing, stay away from the five worst words in the world. And the five worst words, words in the world is I have heard that before. Those words create closed-mindedness instead of open-mindedness. If you've heard it before, uh, the question would be, how well are you doing it? How well are you implementing it? All right, two promises. Uh, the first promise is that you will learn something today that you can use right away, right away. The second promise is I'm available to work with you further, work with you further. All right, and at the end, you, you would get my information to the truth to work with me further, okay. So situated on top of a cliff overhanging the emerald blue waters of the Mediterranean is an ancient Portuguese monastery. The view is really breathtaking. The scenery is magnificent. There's only one problem. The only way to get to the top of the cliff is in an old wicker basket tied to a rope and hoisted up by an aged monk. So one day a guide and visitor were leaving the monastery. And as they stepped into the basket and were lowered down by the monk, the rope swung out over the jagged rocks below. Nervously, the tourist asked, how often do they replace the rope? Don't worry the guide replied in a reassuring tone. We replace it every time it breaks. And just like the story, uh, many of us place ourselves in unpredictable circumstances or situations regarding our health, waiting until it snaps like the rope, and then frantically we grasp onto the latest health fad. Broken health is not as easily replaced as a snapped rope. Health is a matter of choice, not chance. Obedience to nature's laws. Uh, Dr. Breslow of UCLA University of California, Los Angeles, did a research study over a period of nine years, nine years, and he asked 7,000 people uh, seven questions relating to their health habits. And then he observed these patients comparing those who had followed positive health habits with those who had not, right? So 7,000 people over a nine year period to answer seven questions. So here are the seven questions that Dr. Breslow asked these participants. Number one, do you smoke? Number two, do you drink alcohol, and if so, to what extent? Number three, do you get regular exercise? Number four, how many hours did you or do you sleep every night? Number five, how much do you weigh? Number six, are you eating breakfast regularly? Number seven, do you snack between meals on a regular basis. Now, those who faithfully followed the good health habits relating to these 
seven questions, lived an average of 11.5 11, 11 years longer than those who did not. Uh, I hope you got that. Those who followed the health principle, following the right thing to the questions, lived an average of 11 and a half years longer than those who did not. Uh, somebody said, to eat is a necessity, but to eat intelligently is an art. Nutrition refers to the process of providing your body with the necessary food components uh, like micro, macronutrients and micronutrients for growth, energy, and overall health. The concept of balanced nutrition involves consuming a variety of foods in appropriate proportions to meet your body's needs. So it's important to be mindful, to be aware of what you eat and to make conscious choices. Nutrition is not just about satisfying hunger, but plays a crucial role in supporting physical and mental health. It affects your energy levels, your immune system, and even your mood, your mood. So let's talk about uh, minerals and vitamins, which are under the umbrella of micronutrients, micronutrients. Uh, micronutrients are essential uh, nutrients required by your body in smaller quantities, but they play critical roles in various bodily functions. So if you look at vitamins, the first category, uh, vitamins support your immune system. For example, vitamin C in foods like broccoli, cauliflower, they aid in bone health, vitamin D, which you can find in orange juice and sunlight, right? Uh, it, it gives antioxidants, vitamin E, like sunflower seeds and greens, right? They give antioxidants to fight all the free radicals in your body. If you look at minerals, the second category, minerals are important for your bone health as well. For example, calcium that you find in, in leafy greens, like broccoli, uh, is good for muscle con contraction, right? Magnesium you find in your nuts and your legumes. And this is good for maintaining fluid balance. And of course, potassium found in bananas. So it is important to ensure that adequate intake of vitamins and minerals are done every day. Different foods provide various micronutrients and a balanced diet is essential for overall health. Overall, vitamins and minerals are like nutrient helpers. They support a lot of bodily functions and processes, and they are essential for optimal health and well-being. Let's try to understand now what are macronutrients. That includes protein, fat, and carbohydrates, right? The, the main three, right? So they're the three primary components of our diet and provide energy and are essential for various bodily functions. For example, our carbohydrates. Uh, the body's primary source of energy comes from carbohydrates. And we will deal later on with all of these suggestions that we should avoid carbohydrates, right? We will see if that's a good idea or not. Uh, the common sources of carbohydrates, the good carbohydrates are grains, fruits, and vegetables. Grains, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, protein, another macronutrient. Uh, this is essential for the repair of your tissue when you get damaged or hurt. It's good for immune function and it builds enzymes and hormones. And some people believe that you can get protein from meat, uh, but we want to suggest beans and broccoli. And the third category under macronutrients is fats, fats. Uh, fats involves energy storage, insulation, and cushioning of your organs. And some good sources of fat that's good for your body comes from in the form of avocados, nuts, and olive oil. It is significant to have a balanced intake of all three of the macronutrients for overall health and well-being. An imbalance can lead to health 
the serious health issues. So the debate is, should we have low carbs or no carbs at all? Low carbs or no carbs at all? Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, uh, the Bible tells, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the honor and glory of God. And the question may be asked, may I not do what I like with myself? Am I never to have my own way? Is not my body my own? You may have your own way, but it will be at the loss of your soul, or you may have God's way and live uh, to a purpose in this world and in the world to come of life everlasting. That's our manuscript uh, 60. So let's go back to the uh, no carb or the low carb diet, right? Now, this kind of diet is highly restrictive with unknown long-term effects. A no carb or a low carb diet it is highly restrictive uh, with unknown or long-term effects. A no carb diet restricts foods with fiber and most plant foods that are rich in vitamins and minerals. And you'll see later on why you need fiber. And without fiber, this may lead to constipation, low energy, and possible micronutrient deficiencies. So if you find yourself right now constipated, one of the reasons that you may be on a low carb diet and you're not getting enough fiber, enough fiber. So low carb experts advocating a low carbohydrate diet um, have condemned the consumption of starches. They say that even whole grains sabotage your health. Consuming a high protein diet does assist in weight loss. That is true. But is it the very best choice? Does the type of protein we eat make a difference in our desired goal to achieve health? So let's talk about refined carbs, right? Now, this is generally not totally accurate, but no doubt about it, consuming sugar eating refined grains and fried potatoes increases your risk for obesity, for diabetes, liver damage, and a decline of the functioning of your kidneys. While simple carbohydrates in the form of sugar, high fructose corn syrup and desserts are detrimental when consumed regularly or excessively, Good carbs from whole grains, whole fruits, and whole vegetables are essential for the health of your brain. As important as protein and healthful fats are, we still need to eat good carbs for optimal brain performance. And here is the evidence. Low carb diets reduce cognitive functioning. It reduces the proper functioning of your brain. Glucose, which is sugar, glucose from carbohydrate is the brain's preferred fuel. Notice the glucose that you get from, from the good carbohydrates is the fuel that your brain prefers. While your brain uses glucose as its primary fuel, it has no way of storing it. So then what does that suggest? If your brain cannot store the glucose from the carbohydrates that you have consumed, that means you need to keep consuming the carbohydrates to give your brain the fuel that it needs, right? I think that's simple for everybody to understand. A reduced intake of carbohydrate consequently reduces the brain's source of energy. Now, at Tufts University, uh, a study shows that when dieters eliminate carbohydrates from their meals, they performed more poorly on memory-based tasks that than when they reduce calories but maintain carbohydrates. The woman dieters 
were divided into two groups. One group ate a low calorie diet while the other group consumed a low carbohydrate diet. They took tests to measure their cognitive performance before and after their three week diet. The low carb dieters showed a gradual decrease on the memory related tasks compared with the low calorie dieters. And reaction time for those on the low carb diet was slower and the visual spe spatial memory was not as good as those on the low calorie diet. So the visual spatial processing refers to the ability to perceive, analyze, synthesize, uh, manipulate, and transform visual patterns. However, the low carbohydrate dieters actually responded better than the low calorie dieters during the attention vigilance task. In sustained attention or vigilance tasks, the participants are required to monitor the environment over an extended period. So true or false, true or false. A calorie from one food is the same as the calorie from another food. Is that true or false? False. False. false? Okay. Anybody else? Anybody saying true? Okay, all right. All right, so the answer is not exactly true. Low carbohydrate diets do seem to help weight loss, but the truth is that any diet that controls the sudden surges in blood sugar helps weight loss. It does not have to be a low carb diet. All right, let's talk about the glycemic index. I'm sure you've heard uh, this term before. I'm not sure how well mm -hmm. you understand it. So let's kind of break it down, right? So the glycemic index or the GI is a helpful tool that allows you to see how the fruits, the vegetables, and other carbohydrates you eat affect your blood sugar levels. And it ranks food from zero to 100. So you can either go on, on online on Google and type in glycemic index, right? So it, as we said, it allows you to see how the fruits, vegetables, and carbohydrates that you eat affects your blood sugar levels. It runs from zero to 100. So the diet that emphasizes low glycemic foods also results in weight loss. You may ask how? Well, foods with higher ratings of 70 to 100 produce a spike in your blood sugar levels and trigger triggers your pancreas to release large amounts of insulin. Now, insulin is a hormone that facilitates the transportation of glucose and fatty acids into your cells to be used as energy. While we need a appropriate amounts of insulin, high levels of insulin circulating through your blood promote fat synthesis and make it difficult for your body to burn stored fat. All right, so low glycemic index foods release glucose more slowly and steadily, and this uh, result in better food glucose readings after a meal and prevent sudden surges of blood sugar and steep insulin levels. Studies show that the low glycemic index diet has similar metabolic benefits to the very low carb diet with two important differences. The low glycemic diet also does not produce the stress and the inflammation seen on low carb diets. In contrast, low carb diets increase cortisol levels and C-reactive protein, which is a marker for inflammation. A low glycemic index or low GI diet offers another advantage. 
after weight loss, the rate at which people burn calories slows down. This makes it difficult for the needed weight loss to be maintained, so you, you regain the weight. A low glycemic diet is more effective than the conventional approaches at burning calories after weight loss in a tea. So what foods, you may ask, score low on the GI or the glycemic index um, index? or the GI index? Well, most vegetables, uh, what we call cruciferous vegetables, like the green, the broccoli, celery, the all related, salad, veggies, greens, onions, eggplant, squash, sweet potatoes, carrots. Most whole grains, rye, barley, oats, spelt, millet, millet uh, long grain, brown rice, whole grain pasta. Uh, also in leg legumes, kidney beans, lentils, lima beans, split peas, black-eyed peas, green peas, almonds, peanuts, chickpeas. Uh, in your seeds, your chia, your flax, sunflower, pumpkin, sesame. Uh, and the fruits, cherries, prunes, dried apricots, grapefruit, apples, berries, pears. And protein have the pros and the cons, all right? So eating a protein-rich breakfast curbs your hunger and reduces unhealthy snacking on high fat or high sugar foods in the evening. A higher protein intake increases the hunger fight hormone known as peptide Y. <laughs> Eating more protein in the morning rather than packaged cereal also helps to prevent blood sugar spikes. So there was a study done we show that there are dangers in adopting a high protein diet, especially if it is animal protein. Even though high protein diets like the Atkins diet do produce weight loss, rodent studies indicate that this type of diet is not the best for human health. When mice were fed a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, they had brains 5% lighter than all the other mice and regions of their hippo hippocampus, which is important for mood and memory, were less developed. In other words, a high protein diet tends to shrink your brain. A diet rich in animal protein during middle age makes you nearly twice as likely to die and four times more likely to die of cancer. This mortality factor is compatible or comparable to smoking. So we are advising to replace the animal protein. Replacing animal protein with legumes is a better and a safer route. A systematic review and meta-analysis of all available clinical trials found that people felt 31% fuller after eating an average of 160 grams, which is one serving of dietary pulses compared with a controlled diet. And as previously mentioned, legumes score low on the glycemic index and are high in fiber. People shed more weight on an entirely plant-based diet, even if carbohydrates are included. Other benefits of eating a vegetarian diet include decreased levels of saturated and unsaturated fat, lower body mass indexes, and improved intake of macronutrients. The ability to shed weight is faster for those who adopt a total vegetarian diet than those consuming meat and dairy, or even those who eat a mostly vegetarian diet. So one study showed that at the end of six months, individuals on the vegan diet lost more weight than those individuals who ate a mostly plant-based diet and those who were omnivores by an average of 4.3% or 16.5 pounds. A meta-analysis of 12 studies demonstrated that vegetarian diets are more effective than non-vegetarian diets for weight loss. 
So how do, do carbs function in the body? Well, the main role, as we said before, of carbohydrates is to provide energy to sustain your body's functions, including respiration, circulation, digestion, physical activity, brain function, and protein synthesis. When these basic needs are met, any excess carbohydrates consumed is stored in the liver and the muscle cells in the form of glycogen. This storage is released during times when the amount of carbohydrates being consumed is less than the amount needed by the cells in your body, such as during fasting and prolonged exercise. So how much carbohydrate should we consume per day? In order to provide for the energy needs of all the cells in your body that use glucose as a primary fuel, we need to eat more than the minimum amount. For example, the suggested range on this macronutrient on a 2,000 calorie diet would equal 225 or 335 grams of carbohydrates per day. On average, children and adults need a minimum of 130 grams of carbohydrates each day in order to maintain adequate brain function. Let's talk percentages. 45 to 65% of our calories should come from carbohydrates. 10 to 35% of calories should come from protein. And 20 to 35% of calories should come from fat, the good fats, while limiting saturated fat and trans fat. Isaiah 55, 22 says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen to me carefully and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. Isaiah 55, 2. All right, let's talk briefly about hydration and health. We covered this in depth before. They will just cut it lightly, right? Hydration and your health. So the role of uh, hydration on your body. As we see here, your brain is made up of 83% uh, water, your kidneys 83%, your lungs 85%, your eyes 95%, your heart 75%, your blood 94% of water, your muscles 75% of water. So hydration plays a critical role in maintaining and promoting overall health and well-being. And water is a fundamental and indispensable component of the human body. So let's look at water and bodily functions, right? Water's journey through your body. How water is involved in various vital bodily functions. In digestion, water aids in the breakdown of food and, and absorption of nutrients in your digestive system, in your digestive system, right? Water is the major component of most of the body parts that we just alluded to. It allows uh, the body cells to grow and reproduce. It lubricates the joints of the body. Water forms saliva, keeps uh, mucosal membranes moist, and converts food to smaller components. All the good stuff that it does. Amen. All right. Uh, again, how is water involved in various vital bodily functions? In circulation, water makes up a significant portion of blood, facilitating the transport of oxygen and nutrients to your cells. In temperature regulation, Sweating and evaporation help to regulate your body's temperature, which is crucial for staying cool and preventing overheating. In your cellular processes, water is essential for biochemical reactions within cells, enabling them to function optimally. Let's go into some more about fiber, right? Fiber, a digestive uh, health ally. So there are two main types of dietary fiber, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber dissolves in water, uh, forming a gel-like substance that can help lower cholesterol levels. And you get this soluble fiber in foods like oats, bran um, beans and fruits like apples and citrus. Uh, insoluble fiber, doesn't dissolve in water and adds bulk to your stool, aiding in regular bowel movements. And some sources of 
insoluble fiber include whole grains, vegetables, and nuts. In uh, 3 John 2, God tells us, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, I come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In Exodus 15, 26, God through Moses says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these or the diseases on you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So God is the healer and he's telling us the foods that we should eat to keep us healthy, which is healing us. He continues, so you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. That's God's promise to us. Do, do you catch the significance of this? If we follow the Lord's instructions, the effects of diseases can be reversed. And that is priceless information. It's an amazing promise. In Psalm uh, 105, verse 37, it says, there was not one feeble person among uh, th their tribes. Well, you see, the Egyptians probably didn't have the same diseases that we did, but that's wrong, right? We, in, in our very first seminar, we talked about all of the Egyptian diseases and that they had diabetes, cancer, kidney failure, heart disease, just like we have. And if we eat like them and disobey God, we would die just like them, sad to say, all right? So God designed our bodies. He knows how we can avoid diseases and keep our bodies at optimal or optimum performance. And it will certainly be worth our time to go back to the Garden of Eden, back to creation, and notice some of the things God told Adam and Eve that promote good health. Before sin came, God gave Adam and Eve a perfect diet to sustain and promote their health. In Genesis 1.29, God says, and see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you, it shall be for food. And let me just put in something here. You notice that it talks about the herb with seeds, fruit with seeds. If you buy a fruit and it's seedless, that's a food that was made in a lab. That's a part of God's, that's an abomination. Seedless watermelons, seedless so-and-so, those things are dangerous to eat, they're made in a lab. Just giving some advice, just giving some advice. All right. In modern language, we would say that Adam and Eve were given fruit, grains and nuts. This was their food. After Adam and Eve sinned, God added vegetables to their diet, vegetables to the diet. And God said, and you shall eat the herb of the field, the herb of the field, fruits, grains and nuts and vegetables were man's total diet until the great flood. Was it adequate? Yes, indeed it was. And if you would consider that people on God's original diet lived to be hundreds of years old. Plant life on the earth was severely limited by the great flood, of course, and Noah's supply of food was exhausted. He and his family had lived in the ark for more than a year. Only then did God allow Noah and his family to eat animals as an emergency. God gave guidelines for the healthy food for man to eat. It is apparent then that no one knew which animals God considered clean or unclean. And in the book of Leviticus, it tells us that. It says in the book of Genesis chapter five, verse 27, so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So Methuselah, was the oldest man that ever died. He was the oldest man that ever lived on the earth 
and the oldest man that died, almost a thousand years old, 969 uh, years. After the flood, man's lifespan decreased in a marked way. Noah's sons, Shem, uh, lived 600 years. His grandson, 239 years. His great-grandson, 175 years. So by the time of King David, man's lifespan had decreased to 70. Life on a meat diet. Later when God brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, he gave Israel dietary principles to protect their health and longevity. God identified which animals were clean and which were unclean for food. Now, we know now that blood carries impurities, hormones, viruses, and the, you know, the waste of your body. And many diseases are passed on through your blood. We also know that highly saturated fats, like those found in meat, cause a rise in the cholesterol level of your blood. And this is an important factor in vascular and heart diseases. Now, food is one of the special pleasures of this life. We know that God wanted us to enjoy our food because he created us with the, the uh, taste buds to appreciate its flavor. God placed nearly 10,000 taste buds on the human tongue. And if you see here on your tongue, if you drink something bitter, you will tend to taste it in these taste buds here. Something sour, these to the side. Something salty, more to the front. Something sweet, the tip of the tongue. Yeah? But while we enjoy the taste of food in our mouths, how many of us ever think about what happens to that food once we swallow it? Digestion is a process by which the body breaks down food into its components. And this work is primarily done by enzymes, which act like scissors, cutting large nutrients into smaller bits. In this way, carbohydrates may be broken down into glucose, fats into fatty acids, and proteins become amino acids. So the blood can pick up these smaller substances from the intestines and carry them throughout your body. Digestion actually begins in your mouth. So step one is where chewing breaks up large food particles uh, into smaller particles. And this is important not only to avoid choking, but also so that so much, uh, as much surface area on the particles of the food are exposed as possible so enzymes can begin digestion. Most of our digestion begins in the mouth. That's why we have to masticate or chew our foods properly so it can be saturated with the enzymes. Step two, the salivary glands secrete mucus into your mouth, which moistens and lubricates the food particles before you swallow them. Saliva also uh, contains enzymes. And while we are chewing and mixing the food with saliva from our salivary, uh, so saliv salivary gland, sorry. Step three, a third function of saliva is to dissolve some of the molecules in the food that you're eating to activate the chemical receptors in your mouth, giving rise to the sensation of taste. Carbohydrates, for example, start getting broken down in your mouth, and this process continues down in the small intestine. Protein digestion, however, begins in the stomach. So again, let's reverse that. So carbohydrate digestion begins where? In the mouth. Protein digestion begins in the stomach, begins in the stomach, and then continues into the small intestine. Fat is digested 
only in the intestines. So let's go again. So carbohydrates begin digesting in your mouth. Protein begin digesting in your stomach. And fat begins to be digested only in your intestine. Your stomach has a very important role indeed in digestion. And it has three basic functions. It breaks down food, it absorbs fluid, and it secretes acid. So after leaving the stomach, the food goes into the intestine where digestion continues. Digestive juices produced by the liver and the pancreas uh, really help in this process. And finally, any leftover food uh, residue is channeled through the large intestines and discarded as waste to the rectum. So we can see from this that the body has a very orderly way of handling food. However, many things we do upset this process and cause great distress to our bodies. One of the worst habits relates to the time we eat. It's not just about what we eat that matters, but also when we eat. Your digestive machinery works best when it is given time to digest one meal and rest a bit before the next meal comes along. So when we add more food into our stomachs before it has finished digesting the previous meal, the digestive process slows down until the stomach can process the new food. This is why if we eat too often, our stomachs may keep working all day and sometimes long into the night. And you don't want that to happen. So that way you feel tired all the time. Eating a meal high in fat also slows down digestion. Fat in large amounts covers the food in the stomach and makes it greasy. This prevents many enzymes from uh, working properly. Gallbladder problems and stomach deficiency go hand in hand because fat is broken down uh, in a process made by the gallbladder. Gallstones form uh, form in your stomach when in your in your gallbladder, right? And then we want to go and have an operation to remove the gallbladder to relieve the pain from the gallstones. The bile, however, continues to drip constantly from the liver and your body actually makes another little pouch and nothing changes. You feel better, but more stones form and the symptoms return two to three years later after your gallbladder surgery. If the amount of fat in a meal is not large, it will make little difference in digestion time. But a typical Western meal, because of its high fat content, may need five to six hours or longer to pass through your stomach. Eating snacks between meals also disrupts the orderly digestive process and stresses your stomach. Just as many or any machine kept constantly at work, day in, day out, they will wear out faster. Eating too frequently can cause your stomach to become weakened and show signs of distress. Drinking water with your meal also slows down your digestion. It is much better to drink plenty of water between meals, like an hour and a half to two hours after a meal. Drink water at least 30 minutes before a meal and wait two hours after a meal before drinking water again. This will help you uh, stay hydrated, and protect you against the hungry feeling that sometimes comes between meals. 
So what about eating a large variety of foods at one meal? You know, you go to the all-you-can-eat all you buffet. Too many different kinds of foods at one meal may cause indigestion. This is because your body can handle three or four kinds of foods at one meal with maximum efficiency and minimum stress. Big meals take longer to digest and often leave us feeling tired and sleepy. Dr. Shyrock said, someone has estimated that every pound of body fat calls for another two thirds of a mile of new blood vessels. And the heart must pump blood through this extra system of vessels. God really wants us to have a happy, joyous, healthy life. He wants us to live life at its fullest. Man is God's property by creation and by redemption. The price that God has paid for us was the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And because man has been uh, redeemed at such an infinite price, he should glorify God in everything that he does. Now, I, I want to show you something that is very interesting. It's not my invention. It was done by Dr. Ophelia German. It's called the revelation of Christ in colors, the revelation of Christ in colors. Uh, red reminds, well, let me, let me go here first. Tomatoes, berries, and peppers contain lycopene and flavonoids like quercetin. Uh, the well-known health benefits of these substances found in the deep red pigment of red foods is the reduction of prostate cancer, lowering risks of heart disease and support for the body's joints and the scavenging of harmful free radicals. Red also reminds us of the blood of Christ and the great sacrifice that purifies our carnal heart. It is the power that prevents the cancer of sin that would destroy the cells of our spiritual life. What about yellow and orange? Carrots, yams, squash, and oranges contain carot carotenoid pigments, as well as other dark antioxidant pigments called flavonoids. They also contain vitamin C and potassium. The bright orange pigment helps reduce age-related macular degeneration or age-related blurry vision and fights harmful free radicals that cause aging and cancer. If consumed twice per week, these fruits and vegetables may reduce risks of glaucoma. These colors remind us of the work of the Holy Spirit, a bright orange fire that fights the spiritual free radicals that are against the pure and undefiled gospel. The Holy Spirit reduces spiritual glaucoma as it gives us eye salve and spiritual discernment. White, cauliflower, pears, bananas, coconuts, garlic, and onions. These fruits and vegetables contain phytoestrogen, that's meaning plant, phyto is plant, plant estrogen. Um, antioxidants called lignans, which provide powerful immune boosting activity by activating the natural killer cells, your B and T cells. These immune phytocells reduce the risk of many cancers. They also help to balance hormone levels, which may, redu which may reduce the risk of hormone related cancers and chronic metabolic disorders. So white represents purity. It reminds us of the purity of the gospel and its power to make the character pure. It represents a strong spiritual immune system by activating the immune system against the cancer of sin, hatred, gossip, wrongdoing, and apostasy. What about green? Things like wheatgrass, kale, spinach, cabbage, alfalfa sprouts, and avocados contain a host of minerals like calcium, folate, vitamin C, and beta-carotene, vitamin A, chlorophyll, lutein, 
and antioxidants as glycosylates. These reduce cancer risks, lowers blood pressure, normalizes digestion, supports retinal health, eye health, and reduces risk of cataracts and arthritis. Green in the Bible is often used to refer to the herbs and the trees. It reminds us of God's power to sustain life. Green is also a symbol of faith and trust, Jeremiah 17, 7. Faith and trust in God help us digest and assimilate the word of God, which supports our spiritual strength and eyesight. Purple and blue, berries, pomegranates, grapes, elderberries, eggplants, and prunes contain carotenoid pigments, vitamin C, fiber, flavonoids, and quercetin. All of these assist in protecting brain cells against Alzheimer's and other oxidative-related diseases. They support retinal health, eye health, lowers your cholesterol, boosts your immune system, and improves calcium and general mineral absorption. Purple and blue, which are colors of royalty, God's royal character. Purple, which is red plus blue, and red means self-sacrifice. Blue means obedience. Blending obedience to the law of God and our faith in Christ's righteousness make us royalty. Receiving Christ's mind protects from spiritual Alzheimer's and reminds us of God's Sabbath. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, the Bible says, so whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. All right, that's the end of our presentation. I'm sure you may have questions. If you do, I may be able to answer them. I have a question. Uh, yes. What was the green represented um, for the spiritual part of the green? The spiritual part of the green? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah, so green in the Bible is uh, refers to the herbs and the trees. It reminds us of God's power to sustain life. It's also a symbol of faith and trust. Uh, you could read Jeremiah 17, 7. And faith and trust in God helps us to uh, digest and assimilate the word of God, which supports our spiritual strength and spiritual eyesight. And then finally, because a lot of these uh, medical missionaries talks and lectures are about um, loss, weight loss, what do you do for someone to gain weight? How can somebody gain weight? Somebody having trouble gaining weight? How many times a day do they need to eat and what can they do? Now, when you say gain weight, that has a lot of connotation. So the, you could be losing weight because you are sick, you're anemic, uh, you can lose weight or be skinny because you, you, you were preemie when you were born, you have some kind of illness, you have diabetes. So it's, it's kind of hard to give a general one fit all with that question. But if you are, I can tell you this, if you're on God's diet, the natural food will give you the natural weight for your height. If you want to gain mass, then you can go to the gym and lift weights. You will gain mass. So I'm sure you're not asking to gain fat, right? So that's no, how... I'm concerned because my, my husband's cheeks are too sunken and I want them to be a little bit more fat, like more, I want him to have more fatty cheeks. Does he want to have more fatty cheeks? <laughs> He's laughing. Hold Do on. you want to have more fatty cheeks? 
Where, where is he? Where is he? I want to see him. Okay, he's right here. Hey, Ke Kevin, do you want to have Yes. You, you want fatty cheeks? Not fatty cheeks. I mean, just full of, yeah. I got, I got have a very fast metabolism, so right. I'm on my feet all the time, and I, you know, I burn up calories like, you know. I don't have a stomach, I, you know. My blood is good and everything's good, but it's just a hard, yeah. But I feel, but I think since I reached a certain age, the, the midlife, my testosterone level dropped a little bit, so I think my my you know, my pants are falling, my face looks sunken in, mm -hmm. but I feel fine. My energy feels big, but I still feel like I'm, you know, and my cheeks are a little lean. Hey man, it's very lean. I feel like, I, I like. All right, so so Kevin, uh, contact me privately, and I, I would make some suggestions. Now, whenever your metabolic rate is too fast, it, 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 there's an imbalance in your system. If it's too slow, it's also an imbalance, right? So, um, you, you're a personal trainer, so you're all in the gym, you're always working out, so you have to eat probably eat more, a, a bigger meal than the regular person because you're burning out that right away. Does, does that make sense? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but he eats less than me. How do you know? Are you with him twenty four seven? Right, right. You see, right, right. So, so well, whenever I see him eat, whenever I see him eat, I don't want to be like eat some more. Yes, I need my husband to eat more. Yes. All right. I need. To Eat. No, I don't like to eat until I'm satisfied. I don't like to, I don't like to eat until I'm full. I don't like that. I, I want you to eat until you're full. Right, Robert Kevin. So my, my moderation of my energy levels. I'm not trying to. He was. Well, he eats. I want to say, if we could switch, he would be. Um, if we would switch, like when I let him. I'm not switching. He's not switching. <laughs> okay, fine. He's not switching. But I'm telling you, you will be you will be bigger if you ate like me. I mean, uh, um, my man. adequate amount of fiber and 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 calories. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. That's no. I'm good. I'm I'm, I'm fine as far as that goes. All right. Uh, Doctor Raymond, you saying something? Um, somebody asked you if they can see the red slide slide again once more. No, no. When I, I'm done, I'm done. You got to pay me for that. Oh. <laughs> Once it's gone, it's gone. All right, Sister Sister Brown, your hand is up. Last I noticed she did not address GMO. GMO food. GMO I did. Food. did. The seedless foods. I did. did. GMO? Okay. Well, okay. Well, uh, let me let me undress GMO. Um. So in the slides, all of the processed foods. That covers in in GMO, right? So GMO, anybody understand what those that acronym means? Genetic Genetically modified organism. And so that's why I was saying that any fruits that you buy that are seedless, that normally have seeds, do not buy it. That is uh, that's a GMO that you're eating there, made in a lab. Do you remember me saying that? Seedless watermelon. That's made in a lab. There's no such thing as a seedless watermelon. Yeah? Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I was surprised. I went on the internet the other night and I was looking at GMO fruits. Would mm -hmm. you believe that the apple, apple corn wheat, I was I, I never liked apple in you. But I couldn't believe that apple is a GMO fruit. I, I'm not getting the name of your thing. You think Aki? Apple, A P P L E is G M O. I know. I I don't know of that. That's yes, I, I I Google it. Apple, the coin, and wheat G M O. Yeah. Um. The the um. The, what am I going to say? The the corn, I know is G M O. The apple, I I don't know about that. Unless you know it's all. So unless it's organic, but just buying up like that, you have to make sure it's organic. I'm not even sure. Okay, yeah, but the um, I, I find yeah, once you buy organic, you should be safe. Um, but but here's what I would say, right? I'm so sure. we know for sure that the 
corn, all corn in America, unless you, you grow it yourself, get your own seeds, they're all GMO. That, that's a certainty. Yeah. Right? That's a certainty. All corn in America is GMO. The apples... I, what... I'm sorry? Except the organic ones. Yes. What? Organic. organic corn. No, they, they're all, they're yeah. all GMO. All right. Okay. Even the organic corn is GMO? Unless you get it from 1950. Anything anything after 1950 is all GMO. Yeah. Corn and wheat. And we to another level. Okay, so wow. if you want to talk, um, could you either indicate by raising your hand or say this is so and so so we know you want to talk but we're trying to avoid the cross talking so we can hear each other all right so i'm going to say that it's gone to another level now where um they're making they're, they were selling what is what are called killer seed um is it killer yeah killer seeds right where when you buy your your fruits or your even seeds now right the seeds would not they will grow the plant and then that's it. So if you try to replant that that, that uh, fruit tree or whatever tree you bought, plant tree, from the seed in the, in the fruit or the vegetable, it will not grow again. So you have to keep going back to them. That's why uh, I think uh, uh, Bill Gates has bought up so much land in the United States to control the food population. So we have to be very careful we have to go back to long ago, planting the land ourselves, growing our own food. It's becoming very dangerous to eat food bought in the groceries. Very dangerous. All right. Um, so somebody had asked for, for this screen. Yes? Yes, Dr. Ray Barn, it was me. Yes. And uh, um, do, do you have it now? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. You're welcome. All right. Um, Mrs. White has another question. 